we have apoc- we have apocalyptic Sundays in our house, right? And so the kid, the my boys, they go to sleep in the same room, so they listen to the Bible when they go to sleep. And the the older li- gets to pick, you know, what what they want, what they get to listen to on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The younger one picks on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and then I get to pick on Sunday. So everybody knows that it's always apocalyptic Sunday, and we listen to either Revelation or Daniel. So they never pick Revelation or Daniel, but it's always what I pick. So love it, listening to Revelation. Um, okay, so though there's temporal blessing and punishment, we, in light of a cruciform apocalyptic approach to the scriptures, the broad, the overarching dominant nature of this age is cruciform and mercy. Right, So even though the Lord does punish the wicked, even the purposes behind the temporal punishment are merciful. Okay, So the reason why punishment happens is out of love and mercy to bring the unrepentant to repentance. Right, So like in the book of Revelation, you're about three times where you get the pouring out of the bowls of wrath, the opening of the seals, and the response of the people, though all these judgments happened, they still did not repent of their idolatry and their uh, immorality and wickedness. So the purpose of the judgments is to bring repentance ultimately. Though sometimes the judgments don't bring repentance, but bring even harder hardness. They bring hardness. So just a number of dynamics that go on in, in the heart of man in relation to God. So Luke 13 is an example of this where you have a belief on the part of of those listening to Jesus that um, uh, that there's a direct correlation between the sins of man and the temporal judgments, right? So he says this time Jesus was informed that Pilate had murdered some of the some of the people from Galilee as they were sacrificing at the temple in Jerusalem. Do you think those Galileans were worse sinners than the other people, Jesus asked? Is that why they suffered? Right? Is God doing temporal judgment one-to-one for the sins of human beings? He says, not at all. You will also perish unless you turn from your evil ways and turn to God. What about the 18 men who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Were they worse sinners? <clears throat> Were they the worst sinners in Jerusalem? No, I tell you again, unless you repent, you will also perish. So you, we have to take a loose approach to temporal punishment and temporal blessing. Okay, That we don't become dogmatic about it, but that we approach it in a broadly general, merciful way, okay? And so you'll hear things, you know, especially in the charismatic circles, you know, temporal judgments will happen, people will die, storms will happen, earthquakes will happen, you get this immediate, they're sinners, that's why it happened. And it's like, well, you know, were the people in the tsunami in Japan worse sinners than... Anybody else? No, the purpose of it is to bring repentance on all accounts, right? Because they died in a tsunami. That is not justice, right? Justice is that lake outside, that valley outside Jerusalem being filled with fire and receiving a resurrected body with eternal conscious torment. That's justice, right? So even dying in a tsunami and in some way, is mercy in the situation. And so we just have to, like, it's merciful in communicating to the rest of the world that God is sovereign over what he's created, and he's warning human beings of the eternal judgment to come. And this is how we have to relate whether it was a direct divine act on that specific group or people, right? Like uh, Jezebel was thrown on a sickbed for her sin. Direct correlation one to one, right? But this guy's this guy's born this guy's born blind, right? In John eight or whatever. Who sinned, him or his father? Uh, 
Uh, well, yes, Adam. That's that's who's to blame for the whole equation. But God will receive glory in it. So we just have to approach it. That's why. That's why I say we have to approach temporal judgments and blessings in light of a broad theology of this age, the age to come, the day of the Lord, and broadly the mercy of God in this age. That that's what's driving everything that's happening, even the temporal blessings and and punishments, because then it, then we can interpret also the temporal blessings in a merciful way. Thank you, God. You know, and we interpret when there's not temporal blessings as the mercy of God. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. But I will praise the Lord. You, you, you see what I'm saying? I've learned the key to contentment, whether I have much or whether I have little, First Timothy 6. And so the key to contentment is setting your heart fully on the grace to be given to you at the revelation of Jesus. So... Acts 17, in the past God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, for he set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he's appointed. In 2 Peter 3, in light of the heavens being stored up with fire, translate it either way, get a definite slant to the whole passage after that and how you translate that preposition with or for being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. The Lord's not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance or come to repentance. So we just have to keep in mind, this is what will bring sensibility. In, 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 uh, because I found that the... Justice workers are real zealous, you know, and that's it's what happens with doctrines that come. People get blown to and fro like the wave of the sea, right? It's, it's the zeal that, that produces the movement of the wave. It's the roar that happens that people are like, yeah, you know, and they just get tossed into delusion over there. And so... We, we want a, a, a grounding in the scriptures of, of what is happening on the bigger picture so that we don't get tossed by men with, with zeal. Zeal's good. We want to maintain zeal, but we just have to have zeal with knowledge. So, Okay, so God's desire for justice, right? God wants mercy, but God also wants justice. Like, he feels it way more than we do. Like, you know, like we get caught up in some issue of justice with the poor or issue of justice with immorality, sex trafficking, or issue of justice with murder and abortion or issue of justice with whatever. Like we get wrapped up in that thing and we think that we're wrapped up in it. Well, we're not wrapped up in it nearly like God is wrapped up in it. You know, So we, we want to identify with God in these things but not get carried away to missing the bigger picture of what God is wrapped up in because he's more wrapped up in mercy towards the wicked than he is wrapped up in justice towards the wicked. You understand? And this is always what happens in, in justice movements is the cross becomes non-existent. The cross just disappears into the background. You get strange gospel of temporal judgment and blessing and who's righteous and wicked and you get this preaching of a perverted gospel of prosperity and condemnation that's temporally bound so that you don't say the same thing to a pimp and a prostitute alike. alike. You, you condemn the pimp and you comfort the prostitute, both of them under sin, both of them condemned to a lake of fire, and you, you usher them both into delusion, one hopelessly, one arrogantly. You know what I'm saying? Rather... You preach repentance to the pimp to be saved from the wrath to come. You preach, you preach repentance to the prostitute in light of the wrath to come. The prostitute forgives. The pimp repents. Repents. Pimp repents. <laughs> right? Like you get, you, you, you get on both sides be, because it's nobody's, nobody's without guilt in the equation, even the prostitute. The prostitute's guilty before God for dishonoring. Right? That has to be repented of. 
she can choose not to dishonor God, even if it means she sacrifices a lot of things for whatever, but everybody's at guilt in the equation, and and we all have to come to terms with with various ways in which that guilt is worked out. But anyway, so, and then you get a common gospel of we're all saved by the same means, right? Oppressor and oppressee alike. And uh, so... Uh, God's desire for justice. The prophetic testimony. Psalm 11, the Lord examines the righteous. Verse 6 is where the Lord, 3 and 4, I mean, uh, uh, 4 and 5, the Lord sits in heaven and on his throne. He, he looks down upon men to examine their hearts. He says, the Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, his soul hates on the wicked he will rain down fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot, for the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. Upright men will see his face. Jeremiah 9, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight. <clears throat> but as for me, I'm filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, with justice and might, to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sins. Hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob, the rulers of the house of Israel, who detest justice, who make crooked all that is straight, who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. Its heads give judgment for a bribe. Its priests teach for a price. Its prophets practice divination for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord in the midst of you? No disaster shall come upon us. And this is the delusion that always happens when, when everything's set on this age and it's kingdom now. We've got to take over the seven spheres and all this stuff. And it's like, no, what always happens is it's all the same Constantinian Christendom thing that the righteous come into power and then they're wicked. Always works this way. There's always the show of righteousness, but behind the doors there's the same grinding of the poor. There's the same stuff going on. It's just like, it, and they put the put the face on. Oh, we're good. There's no disaster going to come upon us. And that's the irony of most of the justice movement things. Is then when you get on the inside of it. There's tyranny and oppression inside the cause for justice. <laughs> anyway, I, I live right across the street from the uh, really well-known big orphan adoption, you know, international organization, and they're known for taking the highest administrative percentage of any of those organizations. So they have the most manipulative television commercials to adopt a child and then I look out from my house, and it's all like Lexus SUVs and Beamers and this big 100-acre complex and brand-new remodeled everything and a huge lake. And I'm just like, all right, this is not taking care of the orphan. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, come on. So um, Zechariah 7 Thus says the Lord of hosts, Render true judgments, show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor. Let none of you devise evil uh, against another in your heart. But they refused to pay attention. They turned a stubborn shoulder and stopped up their ears and did not hear. They made their hearts diamond hard, lest they should hear the law and the words of the Lord of hosts. It sent by his spirit through the former prophets. Therefore, great anger came from the Lord of hosts. So again, the, the, the Lord desires justice, and he sees it more than anyone else, but we have to have the Lord's perspective about the nature of human beings and all having fallen short, and and the, the, the call to a repentance in the midst of a wicked and crooked generation. So the call to imitate the justice of God. <clears throat> Titus 2, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself to us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people 
for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So you get the, you know, the, 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 what the prophets are calling for and, and walking and maintaining righteous and righteousness and justice in, in your midst in light of the day of the Lord, because we want, we want to give a testimony about how God is, how it was in the beginning. There's justice and righteousness. There isn't now. There will be in the age to come, and we want to give a testimony to, to uh, the Spirit of the Lord. So likewise, First Peter 1, Therefore, preparing your minds for action, being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it's written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on, a, on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile. So it's like you get the, look, there's going to be revelation of grace and judgment at the return of Jesus. Therefore, be holy as God is holy. Be children of him. Be like your father and represent God in, in, in faithfulness. Walk out in, in, in fear throughout your time of exile in this age. So most pointedly, you get the tension of justice within the church in light of uh, uh, the tension between justice and mercy in 1 Corinthians 5 and 6, where you have the sexually immoral and the people taking each other to court within the body of Christ. And Paul lays out how you deal with this tension, because again, it's like dealing with the law between Jew and Gentile. It's not a homogenous rule for everyone, right? There's difference based on how God relates to the two differently between Jew and Gentile. Likewise, dealing with judgment and mercy temporally, it's not universal between the church and the world. It's not homogenous between the two. God deals with the church differently than he deals with the world, and likewise, we have to deal with the tension between judgment and mercy with the church different than we deal with it with the world. And what's always happening is that we're, we're making a, a, a blanket statement for believer and unbeliever alike that we want to relate to righteousness and judgment the same with believers as we do for unbelievers. And like a guy I know, he said, don't get all bent out of shape about Christmas and people perverting the, the, the birth of Jesus and materialism. They're unbelievers. They're dead. Of course they're going to. Like, well, why are you been out of shape about it? You know, and so it just kind of like, I remember him saying that and going, yeah, that's like, that's how the Lord, he, he relates to unbelievers with no light and no understanding differently than he relates to believers who have knowledge of salvation. And there's a higher standard in the equation. So <clears throat> so uh, 1 Corinthians 5 and 6 reflect this in a, in a particular uh, context in the church of Corinth. When you're assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. I'm writing you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of a brother. If he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Okay, this is this is talking about if you're repentant, you're not these things, right? Because if you're repentant, you don't want to do these things. You are these things if you are these things. If you're not, if you're not repentant, and you're wanting, and you're scheming, and you're, and we all know, like we can tell the difference when somebody is generally. I mean, you can put on a false show of repentance, but usually, you know, once you have kids, you, you know when there's, yeah, I'm sorry, and when there's real sorrow, you can begin to, so as, as you mature in the Lord and and, and leadership and, and, and guy leading people, you usually can tell when people are genuinely repentant when they're not, and so we're talking about people who are not repentant, and they are these things, and, and you know when they're scheming and manipulating, and they're, they're, uh, doing their thing. So anyway, so he's saying, don't even eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is It is not those inside the church whom you are to judge. God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. So there's a clear delineation between 
how we relate to injustice and in and unrighteousness and people being hurt in various ways within the church versus outside the church. And Paul lays out real clearly that we're, we're not to to execute the law on unbelievers. It's not the place of the church in light of their exile. But we are to execute the law within the church, with, within believers. And so all of the difficulty since Constantine and, and Theodosius and, and executing anyone who, you know, outlawing anything but Christianity and the Inquisition and all that where you get believers punishing unbelievers, it's like, this is not this is not the divine pattern, and the reason it's not is because you don't have the this age versus the age to come and the mercy of God in this age. All you have is the fulfilled kingdom now in the in Christendom, in Constantine. So um, Okay, so he says next verse when you when one of you has a grievance another against another does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? So you, you have important cases in the age to come, judging the world. You have trivial cases in this age. You got a few thousand dollars. You got, you know, it, this is trivial. It, it, it seems if we don't have eternal glory, then then all we have is is temporal difficulty, and the trivial things seem large, right? And that's why we take people to court and such. And I was telling Hans, I have a friend who he he runs a company, and something happened, and and he was getting sued, and so uh, so he was trying to figure out what to do about this and and this lawsuit and. And he's a real zealous man, you know. I mean, he's he's intense, and and uh, and so he's going to the meeting with his attorney to deal. And we're talking about you know big lawsuit. And he's going to the meeting with his attorney, and the Holy Spirit speaks to him out of uh, Matthew five. You know, if you're on your way to to judge, make amends. You know, or otherwise the judge will throw you into prison. You won't get out till you pay the last penny. So he just felt like the Lord told him to to just settle a lawsuit and pay them what they want. Just do it to, to, to make amends. And so he shows up with his, his uh, attorney and he tells him, this is what I want, this is what we're going to do. And his attorney is like, that is quite possibly the worst thing you can do. And he just busts out and he says, no, the worst thing I can do is stand before God and have him tell me, I don't know you. That's the worst thing. And the, his attorney was like, uh, okay, all right, and so they went ahead and and they settled for you know like thirty forty thousand or something. And later on, he found out. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was like this. He he says later on he found out from the other side that that they were going to sue him for like millions of dollars. And but but then it was like he was so surprised that he was just willing to lay down and and not because because he 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 recognized that this is really trivial in light of what's really important in the age to come. So this is what Paul's trying to instill is, look, you have, you have eternal things in the age to come. This age is trivial. Why are you fighting over this age? Because your heart's set on this age, right? So we have to deal with the injustices in our midst and our, our hurt feelings, and hurting one another. And I mean, we're all just going to do this continually, but we have to keep it all in mind that it's mostly trivial and we, we, we have to take our part and repent and make amends and, and fix it because fixing it is a small ouch now versus a big ouch later, right? So he says, uh, uh, incompetent to try trivial cases. Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life versus the life to come? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be? <laughs> shame on you. <clears throat> Can it be that there's no one among you with, who wise enough to settle the dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat. It's already showed that you have no understanding of 
the eternal perspective, you're already completely defeated. We need to reteach all over again, right? And this is coming on the heels of, I would call you spiritual, right? The first four chapters, but I have to call you worldly because you, you do the following men, you're masquerading as kings, I follow so-and-so, I follow so-and-so, and, and it, you have it all set on this age and building up for this age, living for this age, you, you even, and that's why you're falling into immorality, that's why you're suing one another, that's why you have the divisions, like it's all this root cause of of, uh, of not knowing God or the gospel. So, um, so he says, uh, you're already defeated. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded in light of the age to come? Like, what? why not? Why not just walk away from it? Why just take a hit, move on, bless your brother, done. <clears throat> because your heart's set on this life. <clears throat> so, but you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brother. So there is the call to establish justice in the midst and, and punish the wicked and, and these things, but the broader call is to mercy. So there's always the tension, and there's a higher standard of temporal punishment and judgment and declaring judging, judgment on someone who's intentional sin. But again, why are we handing someone over to Satan and, and, and excommunicating him from our fellowship? Why are we doing that? Out of mercy and love, so that they won't be condemned with the world eternally, right? And so we 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 want to we want to hold the tension of the mercy of God and and the justice of God temporally and eternally, and we do this with our kids, right? You know, we pick our battles and we don't we don't hammer down on our kids all over every little thing, or you know, we 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 know when what what something is is intentional, what's not. We know how to shepherd the heart in that hopefully we do otherwise we really scar our kids so so first peter 2 you get just a real direct kind of uh in light of redemptive history as a whole this is broadly how we ought to relate to injustice in this age first peter 2 once you were not a people but now you are god's people once you had not received mercy but now you have received mercy so in light of having received mercy I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against the soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds. Right When they persecute you, you don't retaliate. You, re you respond in mercy and they see your good conduct rather than your retaliation attacking back and they glorify God for the day of visitation the day of judgment, right? And so, <clears throat> same word, visitation, judgment, various translation, variously translated in different translations. So, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, right? So every human institution, whether oppressive or not, that's his point, you remain subject in light of the mercy of God and the day of judgment that's coming. This is his point. And so then he... He works down a little bit to servants or slaves. Be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, mindful that God is merciful to the unjust, so therefore we show mercy instead of retaliation and, and injustice. Mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you've been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. So you, we're being shown an example of the nature and character of God in this age, and being exhorted that under the most extreme injustice concerning the Son of God, having done nothing wrong, and even the judge in the equation washing his hands of showing that he's done nothing wrong, being crucified, he responds with, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He could have, what, what, what did he tell Peter? I can call tw 12 legions of angels. Generally about 6,000 in a legion, 72,000 angels, right? 
one angel, Isaiah, what, 37 or whatever, one angel with Sennacherib's army, 85,000 people cut down, right? Like, this, this isn't like, it's not hard for God to establish justice on the earth. Like, the day of the Lord isn't a difficult thing for him. An instant, 72,000 angels that can cut down in a moment, 185,000. I mean, like, we, we don't have any grasp of the power, but what is happening on the broad level is the restraint and father forgive them they don't they don't know what they're doing they don't they don't know the gravity of the situation the judgment to come the severity of god they don't even know the mercy of god because the mercy of god is meant to lead you to repentance so so he says he committed no sin neither was deceit found in his mouth when he was reviled he did not revile in return when he suffered he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And so the in light of the injustice of this age, we have to have the day of judgment, the day of visitation, that, to which we can entrust ourselves. And when we don't have the judgment of God, we can't entrust our souls to it. And, and you'll see this, you'll hear testimonies, when, when people find forgiveness for their oppressors, it's it's always in relation to the revelation of the judgment of God, and they entrust their oppressor to the judgment of God and forgive them, and that always communicates to the person that's hurt them in whatever way that I'm having mercy on you, and so is God, and and it usually leads to something unfolding after that, right? But when people don't have, even if it's a universalized judgment upon death or whatever, it's kind of mitigated and it's confused, whatever, whatever. But whatever the severity of divine judgment however that is and but to the degree that you have the revelation of the severity of god you can entrust people with forgiveness and trust people into that and a knowledge of the nature of the mercy of god now in this age <clears throat> and so what ends up happening is then when we don't have the judgment of god and we can't entrust people into the hands of god then we don't forgive people and we seek temporal justice against them and what does that communicate? That's all it communicates. Well, he got that. It's like, you got your reward in full. You know what I mean? And that's that. And that's all that comes across. And that's the pain. Like I have a friend who spent, he spent uh, over a year in this, uh, in this uh, sex trafficking house in Fiji, right? And so these women would be brought over from, various areas and uh, and they would be brought out of sex trafficking into this house they'd be taught skills they would be kind of mentored it's a little bit like an orphanage you know or <laughs> there's not a lot of real mentoring going on because there's you, you know there's not one-to-one -one, you can't you know, whatever anyway so th they would be taught jobs and and he said he became so disillusioned with the whole equation because these women were brought out they weren't preached the gospel to they were taught to live for this age, and they, they became just like everybody else on the island with no hope and bored with life and no, they didn't know God, you know? And it was like, if all we have is temporal justice for people, yes, if you can buy your freedom from slavery, awesome. If you can, if you can establish justice in the situation, good. But as long as it's kept in light of the broader picture of temporal versus eternal and the gospel in the equation, then it means something. But if you don't have the gospel in the equation, it doesn't mean anything. And it really is futile. He really came out of that massively disillusioned. <clears throat> so First uh, Peter 4, we have a little bit different anger, angle. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering but you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. But the spirit, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you, right? And so it's, you know, the apostles in Acts 5, like they, they, they rejoiced after the beating because they're count worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. They didn't turn around and go, we need to beat them. You know, eye for an eye bit, right? Like, yeah, eye for an eye communicates, eye for an eye eschatologically, but it doesn't communicate the broader picture and it doesn't really save people unless 
they get the eye for an eye, and then someone comes in and says, this isn't real punishment. Like, you're going to give an account for your life, and it's going to result in eternal punishment. And you know what I mean? Like, you have to have the gospel to interpret what's happening now. It's the same way with, like, the activity of the Holy Spirit. You were sick, then you got better. What does that mean? Right? Well, it means that God is real. Hindus and Muslims be, believe that too, okay? And people get healed in those contexts too. And it's like, okay, well, it means something more. God's real and God loves you. Well, that's good too. That cancels out the Hindus and the Muslims, right? But that doesn't give you a whole lot. Okay, well, God's real. You were sick. Now you're better. I mean, if you're an evolutionist, it doesn't mean anything at all. It's just a fluke, right? A chance, like the rest of everything. But Hey, you, you were sick, you're better, not, God's real, he loves you, and he wants you to go to heaven, right? So now you've added like kind of a a little bit of a redemptive narrative to it. You, you've, you've added the holiness of God and the depravity of man, and you've put it in some kind of redemptive scheme, right? What, however, you're sick, you're better, God's real, he loves you, and he's establishing his divine reign within you and, and his kingdom in you, right? You've done a different redemptive narrative. So all we want to do is say, look, this is what's happened. God did it. He really loves you. We weren't sick in the beginning. There wasn't death. We're not going to be sick in the end. And, and this is a sign of the age to come, that God loves you. And he wants you to be saved from the wrath of God to come. Therefore, let me tell you about the cross. Let me tell you about the judgment to come. Let me tell you how to relate to God and cast yourself on God, right? So we want to take the events that are happening. We want to take the the justice, we want to take the injustice, and we want to relate, we want to take the, the punishment, we want to take the blessing that's temporal, and we want to relate to these events meaning to them. And we want to relate the biblical meaning, which is the, the broad storyline of redemptive history, so that people will be saved and inherit eternal life. So he says, uh, verse 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a meddler. Don't suffer like the world, because the world suffers too. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it's time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will and trust their souls to the faithful Creator while doing good. So in this light, you, you, you kind of have a, a framework within which to relate to issues of justice, issues of injustice, and you can relate to those issues of justice and injustice differently within the church than you do with, with the world. And so if you have injustice happening within the church, there's a higher standard. There's a quicker call to repentance. There's more pressure. There's there's There's... There's more of a, look, we're here to be a witness for God and be holy as He is holy and warn, and warn the world, right? The, we don't take it before the ungodly. They don't know anything about anything. We don't hold the ungodly to the same standard as we hold the godly. The same way we don't hold the immature within the church to the same standards we hold the mature, right? So anyway, the, the, I just say all this to give a little bit of context so that when when you have issues of justice and injustice, we can relate to those with the heart of the Lord. We can relate in the broad overarching sense with mercy in the heart of the Lord. And even when temporal justice and injustice happens, we can relate to those in mercy in the broader sense, right? And bad things happen, we can counsel and say, receive this as discipline of the Lord. The Lord is loving you right now. He's not hating you. The Lord's loving you in the midst of this. And we can punish those within our midst who are in rebellion with a heart of mercy so that they leave knowing that we're in crisis like the Lord's in crisis over them. You know, rather than they leave feeling that we hate them. And so they intuit that God hates them. You, you see what I'm saying? In the same way with the ungodly. And we relate in mercy and we communicate to them that God relates in mercy. But when we hold a gun to their head for their immorality, which is what we do by passing laws over them, by governing the, un the ungodly in the way we're trying to do, 
right? Because that's how they interpret it. They want to do immorality, and we pass a law which holds a gun at their head. What do they interpret that as? God hates them because we hate them. So they have all the rhetoric. And of course, you know, the the gays, all the, they, of course they're going to have rhetoric of, of intolerance and, you know, hate mongering and all this. And it's like, well, how else do you interpret that? But that's not our place to judge those outside the church. We judge those within. And because we're an exiled group, we're a sojourning group. Well, our, our hope isn't set on this age, and this isn't, we're not playing football, we're playing basketball. Play football if you want, if you're a football player, but the game is basketball. We're not living for this age, we live for the age to come. You, you understand what I'm saying? And we can deal with the things of this age, but like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, we deal with them as though we don't. Right? You get that? I know all the justice people are freaking out at me right now, I know. What I mean, brothers, is that the time is short. From now on, 1 Corinthians 7, 29, those who have wives should live as if they had none, those who mourn as if they did not, those who are happy as if they were not, those who buy something as if they it were not theirs to keep, those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them, for this world in its present form is passing away. Because the time is short, the passing away at the day of the Lord and the return of Jesus. So again, this isn't a theology of disengagement. A theology of the cross is a theology of engagement, that God is engaged with the world in mercy and through the cross inherently given testimony that all have fallen short and need a sacrifice on their behalf. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, some guy is doodling along, and you walk up and say, "Hey, brother, I pay. I paid your debt for you." He's like, "I didn't have a debt." Like the message of, "I paid three grand for you." I didn't have a debt, right? Well, it's like the fact that I did it says something about you and what is going on with you. So the very fact that the cross happened, you know what I mean? Like says something about humanity, and so. Um, so anyway, so the, the cross is an engagement with the injustice and the debts of humanity and the judgment to come. And so our place is not a disengagement with the world, but an engagement as a witness living for the age to come, not engrossed with the things of this world in this age, right? And so the reaction is always of the kingdom now group is the heavenly destiny, monastic, pull back, disengage, all this. That's not what we, that's, that's not what we do. We engage with the world, in the world, but not of the world. Our hope not set on this age and warning acts of unrighteous, warning people, look, you continue in this, you continue in this oppression, you continue in this manipulation, you continue in this path of life without repentance. And there's going to be eternal judgment on your behalf, right? So that's what the Lord has called us to in light of injustice is the witness of the justice of God. All right. Beat that horse for a while. So, Lord, we just ask you for grace in these things, God, like a father with his children, with grace and mercy towards uh those who have children know just how from the youngest age the manipulation and deceit within children and as well as the glory but we 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 understand the nature of humanity we want us to have the same heart father to deal with people in love like you deal with people in love to deal with the wicked and the cruel and the unjust the same way that you deal with them god in patience and mercy and kindness with the conspiracies of men, God, that you relate in patience and love. And so we just ask you, Holy Spirit, you would impart that to us, God, in the midst of so much confusion in the church today, God, that you would impart that to us. You would impart your heart by the Holy Spirit, that you would reveal the deep things of your heart, which are manifest in the cross and made known in the cross, God. In the name of Jesus, amen.